I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. This is our regular weekly message. And today we're finishing up our five part message series entitled, Not Just Mere Words. And indeed, words are not frivolous. Words carry a lot of weight. The Lord God spoke everything that we see into being with words. God, our healer, sent his word and healed all of our diseases. Jesus cast out unclean spirits with a word. Words are alive and powerful. God said in Isaiah chapter 55 verse 11, so shall my words be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in a thing for which I sent it. Words have purpose. They're employed either for good or for evil. They give life and healing and to build up and unite or they bring death and destruction. They're to hurt and to mar. They wound and they maim. Words live on forever. But here's the good part. Our prayers come up before God in golden vials and he sends us an answer from his great throne. An answer for deliverance out of the situation that we're in, that we've been praying for. Because words spoken never die. And Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. With that thought in mind, let us be super careful how we use our words. Because depending on how we fling our words around determines on who gets hurt. Like a weapon that we do not know how to use, we can actually injure our own selves or we can injure someone that we love. I got a really nice chef's knife for Christmas and it's really, really sharp. I keep it stored in its sheath and in the box that it came in. And every time I use it, I will wash it and dry it right away so that no water stain will form on it. And then I'll store it away again in the box just to protect the edge, to protect its sharpness. Just last week, I washed my knife and was drying it and I somehow cut myself. I have no idea how it happened. It just happened. I didn't even know my finger was so close to the edge because I'm very careful with the knife. I didn't even feel it, but there was a lot of blood. And that's how our words are if we're not careful. Someone says something to us and in response, we speak too quickly before thinking and slice. There's blood everywhere. Someone gets hurt. We must be careful, super careful with our words. So with that said, let us jump right into today's message, Words That Defeat. Turn with me please to our scripture reading found in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1 through 5. Now when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of these heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, yes, what they're doing, if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Hear, O oh, our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captive. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight. 
for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. When Sanballat heard that the Jews were rebuilding the wall, he was spitting mad. He was past the urge. He had arrived. So what does he do? He begins to jeer at the Jews. Now, this English word, jeer, it means to make fun of a person or a thing in a rude, sarcastic manner. Mock, taunt, scoff at. It's translated from the Hebrew word, yaleg. According to the Dictionary of Biblical Languages with Semitic Domains, it means mock, scoff, ridicule. That is, speak words with disparage another. This word, disparage, it's not a word that we use often in our day-to-day -day conversations. So I want to define it for you. It means, one, to lower in esteem, discredit, or two, to speak slightingly of, show disrespect, belittle. So then, when the Bible says that Sanballat jeered at the Jews, it means that he began to mercilessly ridicule and belittle the Jews, mocking them and making fun of their hard work in a rude and disrespectful manner in order to discredit their efforts and kill their esteem. So take a lesson from this. When you begin to do a great work for the Lord or for yourself, when you do something for your own best interest, the enemy will come in like a flood. He will mercilessly ridicule and belittle you. He will despise the work, mocking you and making fun of your call or your promise. He will do it in a rude and disrespectful manner in order to cast doubt on your call, in order to kill your esteem. He does not want you to prosper, nor does he want you to succeed in anything that you do. He's a brutal taskmaster. He'll say something like this. Do you really believe that you're healed? Yes, the pain might be gone for now, but you will never walk again. Sure, the lump in your breast is gone but it'll be back healing is not for you maybe for someone else but not for you remember the devil is a liar the scripture says that he is the father of lies and when he speaks he speaks his native language so do not believe his yelling his mocking his scoffing his ridiculing by Jesus' wounds, you are healed. You are delivered. You are saved. You are sanctified. You are made whole. Believe that. Hold on to that. It's your promise from the Lord, your God. The enemy's words are words designed to defeat. But overcome them with God's word, which outrank all other words. I repeat. God's word always, 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 always outrank all other words. Brother Jimmy Swagger wrote a song. It's called, His Voice Makes the Difference. And indeed, it's his voice, Jesus' voice, that makes all the difference in the world. We must learn to recognize the shepherd's voice. For in his voice, in his words, there's life. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. How do you learn to recognize a shepherd's voice? By practice, by making a conscious decision to actively practice listening to hear and to recognize his voice. What I mean is this, when you're praying, instead of hurriedly trying to complete your obligation, praying for your allotted 10 or 15 minutes or half hour or whatever have you, then jumping to your feet and rushing off to check off the next item on your to-do list 
Instead of doing that, spend an extra five or six minutes, extra 10 minutes, in silent listening for the voice of the Lord your God. He will speak if you will listen. Let me say that again. God desires to speak to you and he will speak to you if you will only but listen. Doing this exercise, listening for his voice, will introduce you to a more intimate relationship with your Savior. You will begin to understand how much he loves you and realize that he is for you and no words of defeat can or will ever, ever, ever defeat you. Romans chapter 8 verse 31 says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? This verse does not mean now that God is for us. We will never again have opposition. No one will ever challenge us or come against us in conflict. It doesn't mean that at all. But rather, it means that certainly the enemy will come against you with words that defeat, but he will not succeed. Even though the enemy can and will still come against you, the promise is you will not be defeated by him. You shall overcome, praise the Lord. We reject discouragement. We refuse defeat. Sanballat and his associates were heaping words of discouragement on Nehemiah and the builders. They were making up lies about them. But why? Why would they do that? What was their main objective for doing that? Well, let us take a look at Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 9. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Their main objective was to frighten or to intimidate the people, to intimidate the workers. Fear and, and intimidation are two of the enemy's favorite weapons. The fear of losing your life, the fear of losing your freedom, the fear of losing your status or your position. Fear will keep you silent. Fear will stop the work. Intimidation will bring the work to a screeching halt. The blaring headlines on PBS website said, Pope says Trump is not Christian for wanting to build a wall on US-Mexico border. I guess the Pope's own words have condemned himself. How can someone who lives behind a wall criticize others for wanting to build? A wall. Not only is there a wall, but you must pay to get into the Vatican City. Likewise, if you say anything these days that is not according to the political agenda, you will be investigated in order to intimidate and defeat. Fear and intimidation are tools of the enemy. It is a way of discouraging the builders and stopping the work. Now the question is, how do we overcome the words of defeat? For the answer, let us look to Nehemiah. But first, I want to give you a little background just to set it all up for you, to give you the big picture of what was going on. Remember that the enemy has heard that the rebuilding of the wall is going on. They're very angry and greatly enraged about it. So they begin to hurl insults on the builders, calling them a basket of deplorables and other insulting names. Words flung with the intent of defeating, thwarting, blocking, and halting the work. But that did not stop the work. The work continued and the wall was halfway built because the people joined together and had a mind to work. There is strength in unity. But the enemy knows that as well. And that's why Sanballat and friends plotted together 
to come and fight against them and to cause confusion in the camp. But the people began to pray. They unified. They sought the face of their God because the enemy was too strong for them, but not for their God. Then here's what Nehemiah did. We're going to read Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. Then we're going to skip down to verse 16 through the first part of verse 18. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in open spaces, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. I want to read that one more time. Nehemiah said, remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, fight for your sons, fight for your daughters, fight for your wives, and fight for your homes. Verse 16, from that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and half held the spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. The people band together and made a pledge to look out for each other and to defend each other, to have each other's back. There is great strength in unity. Remember, if the enemy can separate us, he can defeat us. That is why he spreads seeds of doubt. He tells lies about the people who are actually trying to help us and causes us to doubt their sincerity. Then he deceives us by trying to make us believe that it is him who is looking out for us. That they're doing this for our best interests. Which is the biggest lie of all. The people of Nehemiah's day what they did was they, they worked by day and they guarded by night. No one took off their clothes, meaning no one got comfortable. No one relaxed or took things for granted. They stayed vigilant. They, in, they were informed of the truth. They did not believe the propaganda of the enemy, those who were trying to defeat them. The propaganda was designed to discourage the people and stop the work. Now, I want you to pay close attention to chapter six. We're gonna go into this because all this intimidation did not work. The ridicule, the lies, the propaganda, the threats, the plot and the deceit, the attempts to divide, the, the constant harassment, none of it worked. Nothing that the enemy did or nothing that the enemy plotted worked because the people wanted their city back. They wanted to protect their way of life. They did not want to be enslaved. So they packed out the arenas for the, for, for the rallies. They put their hand to the plow because the people had a mind to work. Now, watch this in chapter 6. The enemy saw that none of their tactics was working. They could not insult them. They could not intimidate them. They could not frighten them. They could not stop the work. When they realized that their main objective, which was stopping the work, could not be achieved, they changed tactics. They tried to infiltrate them by posing as an ally pretended to have their back as in being an important assistant or maybe being their vice president or some close confidant but that did not work either they were found out and as soon as they found that out they saw them for who they truly were lying 
infiltrators. So when everything else failed, the enemy, the enemy of the people, turned to government. They made up lies intending to use government as a weapon to force the work to stop. Try to force it through intimidation, political pressure, unjust legislation, and threats of military action. But the people's hands were strengthened by the Almighty and the wall was finished in record time. Now, look at Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 17 through 19. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Ara. And his son, Jehohanan, had taken the daughter of Meshalam and the son of Barakiah as his wife. Also, they spoke of his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him. And Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. The nobles are the very ones who should be representing the people. The ones who should be looking out for the people's best interests. The interests of the common people. But instead, they were plotting against them. Their own country folk, their own city. Can you just imagine? Nehemiah left his good job in the palace to travel all the way down to Jerusalem to help them and to bring some dignity and prosperity back to their city. And they plot against them. Can you ever suppose that something as dreadful as that could ever actually really happen? The people you are trying to help will rise up against you and stab you in the back in favor of the ones that are actually holding them down. That is just mind-blowing that someone would actually do that. So what did they do? What did the people do? They shook off the words that defeat and they returned to the Lord. And then Nehemiah cleansed them of every foreign, everything foreign. I'm here to tell you, words, can defile you. Words can hurt you. And words can defeat you. But if God is for you, and he is, rise up in his strength and shake off the dust, shake off the hurt, shake off the disappointment, shake off the sorrow, shake off the remorse, shake off the regret, shake off the shame, and come back to Jesus. He's waiting for you. I want to read you the lyrics from Hawk Nelson's song, Words. They've made me feel like a prisoner. They've made me feel set free. They've made me feel like a criminal, made me feel like a king. They've lifted my heart to places I've never been. They've dragged me down back to where I began. Words can build you up. Words can break you down, start a fire in your heart or put it out. Let my words be life. Let my words be truth. I don't want to say a word unless it points the world back to you. End of quote. So let me leave you with this reminder. Words can build up, but they can also break down. Words can start a fire, and those same words can put that same fire out. Words have the power to imprison or to set free. Words can make you feel good about yourself or they can severely dampen your spirit. Words can lift you up and they can bring you down. They can start a fire in your heart or they can put it out. Words are life and words are death. They're truths or they're lies. Words will bring victory or they will bring defeat. It all depends on the words that you let into your mind, into your psyche. 
So then, you must make a conscious effort to never let negative, hurtful, defeating words into your heart. Only feed your soul on words that are uplifting, kind, generous, gracious, words of peace, words of joy, words of life, words that bring healing, words of hope, and anything that is excellent, anything that is of a good report, feed your soul on such things. Get such words of hope deep down inside your heart. And here's the greatest hope of all. Jesus is coming back to get us real, real soon. The early disciples, the early believers, they called it the blessed hope. Do you know him who offers that blessed hope? Jesus has promised never to leave us nor forsake us. He has promised to come back and to receive us onto himself. He has promise to come back to get his own, those who know him, those who are waiting for him, those who love him, so that where he is, we can be also. And never again will there be words that defeat, for we will be victorious in Jesus Christ. Victory in Jesus. If you want to receive that hope, the hope that Jesus offers, by taking Jesus as Lord and Savior. Here's how you do it. All you gotta do is to repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins, for I have sinned against you. I have used my words as weapons to defeat my family, my friends, my neighbors, my coworkers. Forgive me and help me to use my words to build up. Help me to use my words to encourage, to unite, that I might speak words of life. I accept your free gift of forgiveness, Lord Jesus. I accept your free gift of life. I understand now that I'm a child of God. Help me to love you and to honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I want you to get a Bible. It's so important to know the Word of God. Read it for yourself. Get a Bible and read it. Highlight it. Learn those verses. And then I want you to find a Bible-believing church, not a progressive church, but one who believes in holiness and righteousness, one who still believes in the power of Almighty God, believes in the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Come now, enter into the joy of your Lord. And there you'll be with all the other sins. We all be together celebrating the Lord's Supper. That supper, the, the, the meal, the wedding feast of the Lamb. Isn't that a great thought? Isn't that a great vision? A great hope to have? I say, yes, it is. Well, the Lord bless you. Thank you, people. If you watched all of this series, I hope that it was a blessing to you. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.